Thank you, Pastor. Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone, my brothers and sisters at home. I'm glad that you decided to wake up early and be a part of this Sabbath school um, program and the Sabbath school class. Uh, and I'm now going to call class into session. Um, happy to be here, happy to be here on the Sabbath teaching. I'm excited about this week's lesson. I'm excited about this quarter. It's been a blessing and a privilege to be able to study it and to even study and dig in deep into God's word. And I think this week is uh, going to be a, a nice lesson. And uh, again, I want to encourage you, if you have questions, if you um, have a question, and we'll try to keep it related to the lesson, um, throw those questions out on Facebook Live, whether you're on Facebook Live or on the live stream, give those questions to the pastor, and the pastor's going to throw out those questions to me, and I'll do my best by, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit to answer those questions in the most concise um, way that I can. So we are on our lesson quarterly. I hope you brought your quarterlies. I hope you brought your Bibles with you. Uh, we're going to dive, uh, dig in deep into this week's lesson, and um, we're going to study from God's Word. We've been studying about how to interpret Scripture. And this week's lesson, we're on lesson number six. Why is interpretation needed? Why do we need interpretation? Why can't we just read the Bible and know it for ourselves? Why is it that we need someone to interpret it for us? How is it interpreted, and what method should we use to interpret the scriptures? Who should we trust to interpret the scriptures for us? Uh, should we use only one source? Should we use many sources? Um, versions of the Bible, so many different versions of the Bible. Which one is the best to use? Which is the best to use for what purpose? Should we stick to one version? Should we use many versions? These and all these other questions we're gonna, we're gonna try to tackle this week. Our memory text was taken from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, and interestingly enough, the quarterly uses the New King James Version. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Um, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So we understand that faith plays a role in understanding and knowing and interpreting scripture. We look at the Bible and we say, well, how do we read the Bible? How do we interpret the Bible? What principles do we use? The Bible is so full of different types of literature. We know that there are parables, there are prophetic symbols, there are historical narratives. The book of Psalms is really a book of songs. Um, there's poetry, there's, there's storylines, um, there's letters, that are epistles that were written to specific churches to um, address certain specific issues. Uh, we have Old Testament, we have New Testament. We have a book that has um, survived so many thousands of years of scrutiny, so many thousands of years of um, hands dipping at it and dipping into it and pulling from it and, and adding to it that um, we understand that the Bible is the uh, supreme word. Now, us as Seventh-day Adventists, when we think about um, our fundamental beliefs, do we know what the very first fundamental belief of the Seventh-day Adventists? We have 28 fundamental beliefs, but what is the first one? The very first one is the Holy Scriptures. And I love that that, that is what our first foundational fundamental belief is. Number one, it says the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, are the written word of God given by divine inspiration. The inspired authors spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In this word, God has committed to humanity the knowledge necessary for salvation. The Holy Scriptures are the supreme, authoritative, and the infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the test of experience, the definitive revealer of doctrines, and the trustworthy record of God's acts in history. Yes, Pastor, I see a question. So the question is, you mentioned about the, the Old Testament and New Testament. Which is more important, the New Testament or the Old Testament? Which is more important? Certainly, and um, there are many denominations that rely solely on the New Testament, and they feel that the Old Testament uh, relies solely on the New Testament, and they feel that the Old Testament is kind of passe and a good book of old stories that we should just kind of uh, relegate to the um, to to the trash pile. That is not what God's word is. As I just read, Old and New Testaments are the, the the God's divine will, divine inspiration. They were both inspired. It is one book. It is one Bible. It is one will that God had had illustrated to man. 
And when we look at the Old Testament, if you only study the New Testament, half of what, more than half of probably what the New Testament states are quotes directly from the Old Testament. So you are losing the, the, the great um, understanding of the New Testament if you disregard the Old Testament. Old and New Testament are the, 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 the two-edged sword, so to speak. That's why the sword has two edges in the Bible, because we have Old and New Testament to, um, to rely upon. Oh, and the PowerPoint, I almost forgot. There's a PowerPoint to also go along with, with um, why is interpretation needed, and um, we are looking at different aspects of the Bible and why interpretation is needed. When we read a story, sometimes we can read a story, we, we know that a story has an opening, we, ha we know that it has a, um, a beginning, it has an ending, and depending on who's reading the story, each person can come with their own preconceived notions. Most person, depending on the type of individual that you are, for instance, a small child may read a story a certain way and may interpret it one way. A lawyer or a doctor or someone who is a theologian may read the story quite differently and may interpret it differently. There are many factors that may influence our interpretation. We have presuppositions, we have translations, we have cultural experience, which we've spoken about two lessons prior, and we have sin. What may influence our interpretation? Why is interpretation needed? It's very important to understand why we need to have interpretation, because each of us, especially when it comes to studying, reading and studying the Bible, uh, need, need that interpretation. When we think about interpreters, who was one of the greatest interpreters to walk the face of the earth? No other than Jesus Christ himself. He was a great interpreter. He came, in fact, to show God's um, character and to reveal God's character to man and to also expound the scriptures to his disciples. Um, our lesson begins on, on Monday. Um, Sunday is entitled Presuppositions. And the first Bible passage that they give us is taken from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 45, and it says this, now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Isn't it interesting that the disciples were waiting for Jesus' appearing? They realized that he had, they had already been told that he was risen from the dead, that he was no longer in the tomb, and now he appears to them and he says, peace to you, but they are so frightened and so afraid. How did they not know that that was Jesus? And Jesus had to come to the point that he had to appeal to each and every one of their senses. He says, come, see, feel, touch, look, see, it is me. And as if that wasn't even enough, okay, after he tells them, come and handle me and touch me, they see that he's not, they, they, they think he's some kind of ghost, he's some kind of um, phantasm that, that just appeared out of nowhere. He says, come and handle me, see that I'm not a spirit. After they touch him, not only that, they, they touch him, they see him, they see his hands and his feet, they still do not believe. In verse 40, he said, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, but while they, they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So now he has to even take it to a, to, a, to a newer level and say to them, okay, well, you've handled me, you've seen me, give me some food. I'll even show you that, I, that I'm not a spirit. I'm going to eat some, some meat right in front of you. So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are the words which I have spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which was written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding, it says in verse 45 of Luke chapter 24, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. What prevented the disciples from understanding that Jesus was there and he was supposed to be resurrected and he was going to appear to them? They had preconceived notions of who the Messiah was and what his mission was. They had been taught, from, probably from their youth, that the Messiah would come. He would, be the, he would be the offspring from the root of David. He would come and establish an earthly kingdom. He would restore Jerusalem to its rightful place. 
the Roman oppression that was, that was over the, the kingdom of Israel would be dispersed and this new king would come and reign and deliver them and he was going to be an earthly king. They did not expect the Messiah to be crucified and, and be brought back to life the way, the way that, they, that, they, that Jesus uh, appeared to them. So that preconceived notion of who they thought the Messiah was prevented them from understanding and believing that this was in fact Jesus. But Jesus had to open their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Although they knew the scriptures, they did not understand it. Jesus had to interpret it for them and, under, and, and get their preconceived notions removed so that he could show them that what the Bible was speaking was, um, in fact, the truth, the word of God. I like what the lesson says, and um, it, it was kind of a controversial statement, but I want you to comprehend this. It says that total neutrality or absolute objectivity cannot be achieved. I want to say that again. Total neutrality or absolute objectivity cannot be achieved. You think you cannot, so when someone says, I need you to be neutral, if they come to you and I say, I need you to be objective, I'm going to bring a story to you, I'm going to bring a problem to you, can you really be completely neutral? Can you really be completely objective? We all have these preconceived notions. We all have these preconceived ideas. We all come with, with these um, theories and ideas in our minds and our culture and our upbringing and now there's so many factors that can influence us and on how we decide different things and how we see different things even in when it comes to the bible we have different things that can affect the way we interpret the bible and what it's what it's saying and what, what it's meaning um, so these are some of the things because the question is what are your own presuppositions okay we saw the disciples here we are jesus had cho had chosen them they knew the bible they knew the prophecies regarding the messiah but they, were, they, they, they had it all wrong. And I oftentimes think they got the first coming of Jesus wrong. How is it with us Adventists? Are we prepared for Jesus' second coming? Do we have his second coming wrong? Are we confusing the first coming with the second coming? Are we expecting Jesus to come as a, as a lowly lamb, meek and lowly? Or is he going to be coming as that conquering Messiah that, that the Bible speaks of? The disciples thought he was going to come as a conquering king, but he came meek and lowly. Are we expecting him to come meek and lowly, or is he going to be coming as a conquering king? Yes, Pastor, I see another question. So in, in context of what you're saying there, the uh, question is, um, can we do the interpretation in our own way? So I think they're kind of asking, you know, how, how do... The example you gave, the Pharisees and the people then were interpreting the Bible their way, what they wanted. So, so maybe we should ask the question, how do we avoid that same trap when it comes time to read the Bible and study the Bible? How do we avoid interpreting it our own way when we read it? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it, there's a very big danger in the fact that uh, the Bible says that in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Now, that doesn't mean that because the whole world believes one thing that I have to automatically believe it. Or it doesn't mean that when the whole world believes something that it's the truth. Okay, we have to be guided by the Holy Spirit, and this is why the Holy Spirit is so important. We need him. We, Jesus said, I will send you another comforter, the parakletos, the one that is exactly like me. He said, he will guide you into all truth. So the, 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 the concept of the Holy Spirit, his power, his way of us, for him to open in our understanding, every time before we sit and we open God's word, we need prayer. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit is going to come, that we can remove those presuppositions, that we can remove those preconceived notions of who the Messiah is or who Jesus is or who God is or even who the Holy Spirit himself is. We need to remove those preconceived notions and allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. We have to empty ourselves and let the Holy Spirit uh, fill us and indwell within us. Um, so the next translations, Monday's lesson, translation and interpretation. Okay, how do we, you know, um, anyone who speaks two languages, and, and I can speak Spanish, and anyone who knows more than one language, you can understand that not every word in one language can be directly translated word for word into another language. For instance, and even within the very English language itself, if I say to you, that's cool, what does that mean? 
It could mean that it's cold in here. Or if I'm using a more colloquial sense of the term, that's cool, I could say that's a good thing. That, and, and if I try to translate that's cool word for word, most likely the most common definition is going to be that it's cold in here. So if I translate that from one language into another, the meaning is completely lost, okay? So interpretation, this is why interpretation is important because if I translate it word for word, then the, the word is just gonna mean that, okay, it's cool in here and it's gonna lose the context. So when we're talking about the study of scripture, okay, we have to use that in that same light. Okay, we can't just go word for word in every sense. We can't just go meaning for meaning. We just can't go idea for idea. Sometimes it's a combination of, of, of many different um, uh, methods of study. I'll give you an example. Also, when it comes to the study and, and Bible, the Bible is its own interpreter. We have to use the Bible to interpret the Bible, okay? We cannot build doctrine upon one line or one sentence, okay? The, the, the Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. The Bible is its own exposit. Even though it was the Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew, the New Testament was primarily written in, in, in this coin Greek, okay? And we have certain sections like the book of Daniel that have certain portions of Aramaic. Now, as far as I know, nobody speaks Aramaic. Nobody really speaks the original, true, original Hebrew language in its purest form. And no one speaks Koine Greek either. So we, we oftentimes had to rely upon translators to get the idea across. Now, having said that, which translation of the Bible, and, and Brother Stephan did an excellent job last week with the slide that he presented with regards to the different versions of the Bible. How do we know what translation is the best translation? Which translation is the most accurate? The answer is a very complicated one, okay? Yes, I know that there are certain translations that word for word are the best translations. And as the, the um, slide uh, last week uh, presented, Brother Stephan, the New American Standard Bible, the King James Version and the New King James Versions are some of the biggest examples, the best examples of word-for-word -word translations that are the most accurate. Now, does that mean that the King James Version, the New King James Version, and the New American Standard Bible are perfect, are 100% accurate? No, it does not, okay? Because just like I said, a word in one language, and sometimes one word in one language can have three meanings. So how am I gonna know which meaning is is the, the Bible writer or the, the, the passage trying to say to me. One word can have three meanings, so if I'm gonna have to make, I'm gonna have to come to a point where I'm gonna have to choose one of those three meanings, and I'm gonna have to insert it, and me as a uh, interpreter or a translator, or this in some instances, many instances, when the Bibles were translated into different versions, groups of panels of scholars were put together to do the translation, and they would have to come to a consensus as to what they felt was the most accurate word to use in that, in that instance. This is why when studying scripture and studying these translations, okay, we have to use the context. The context of the Bible is very important. Yes, Pastor. Uh, a question, um, is it possible with all the different translations to still be able to show all of the Bible doctrines? So in other words, can can you show the Sabbath from all the translations? Can you show uh, State of the Dead from all translations? Can you show, uh, you know, thinking in the context of Seventh-day Adventists and our teachings, can you show our teachings from all the translations that are out there? Yes, and this is what the beauty of the Bible. Why do we have four Gospels? Why do, and why do they call them synoptic Gospels? It's for that reason, because you have four witnesses that were there that walked and talked with Jesus, that were inspired by the Holy Spirit, that wrote things, and yes, are the four Gospels 100% word for word exactly the same? No, they are not. There are some um, writers, for instance, Luke was a doctor, so he writes from his physician standpoint. Matthew was a, 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 a traditional Jewish scribe, and he wrote it from a Jewish perspective. So yeah, they had different um, uh, uh, methods of writing the Gospel in different formats, but yet they are all in harmony. So yes, Pastor, to say truth is truth, and the way the Bible was written, when we think about the ancient Hebrew, we think about the Old Testament, we think about the New Testament, we think about how many years, okay, from, from the first 
book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible, how many years transpired, how many different languages were used, and you think of the perfect um, perpetuity of the Bible and how accurate it is in terms of doctrine, okay? Regardless of which version you use, doctrinally the Bible is going to remain the same. Now you might be able to study differently and study more, more um, uh, in depth and get, gain a, a better understanding, but in terms of the, the Sabbath, the state of the dead, uh, many of the doctrinal beliefs that we have, if you study the Bible in its entirety, line upon line, precept upon precept, you will come to a basic understanding of those Bible doctrines. So, um, yes, translation is, is uh, an integral part of, of uh, our understanding of interpreting scripture, okay? It was written in, by, in Hebrew. Translations involve two main issues. The original words may not have an exact translation into our language. There are some words that you just can't translate, so you have to take the idea or the thought or, um, and then uh, try to find the best word that suits that word. You know, there won't be a word for word translation. Like I said, when I try to, oftentimes I would be called to translate for people who spoke Spanish who didn't know English and I would be called to translate. And it, it can take me, a, if you're not really, really well versed in the, in the language, it can take you a few seconds. You have to stop and think, well, what was that word again? And how do I express that word? And if I was to say to uh, try to translate that's cool in Spanish to a person to try to convey the message, I'd have to use words that don't even imply cool, because if I use any, any form of the word cool in Spanish, it, the, the person's not going to understand what I'm saying. So we'd have to find something that meant it even different. So the different translations. And I like this next slide, because this goes along also with, with the slide that Stefan used last week. Okay, you got formal, dynamic, and you have a paraphrase. You have some Bibles that, again, that are formal, that are word-for-word -word translations, like I mentioned, the, the, the New American Standard Bible. And by the way, according to most Bible scholars, the New American Standard Bible gets the Gold Star Award in terms of word-for-word -word translation. Now, does that mean that the New American Standard Bible is the best Bible and the only Bible and that's the only one you should use? No. Okay. Yes, I have my favorites. I have my personal favorites that I like to use but I like to use different versions depending on what I'm doing. If I'm coming up here to teach a Sabbath school lesson, I'm going to use a different method of Bible study than I would, for instance, if I'm coming up here to do a scripture reading. If I'm doing a scripture reading, sometimes the NASB or the King James can be very difficult, especially when you're trying to reach younger people or, or, or a younger audience. Using the thou's and the arts and the shouts, it's kind of passe, it's kind of an old language that, that people just disconnect automatically. Now. Those are your formal translations because they try to stay as close to the original language as possible. But when you translate it, some of it, as they always say, gets lost in translation, some of the ideas. Yes, Pastor. Okay, so a question here. Um, good information on the, the, the different um, translations there. Uh, the question is, what books or what could you use to assist you in your study of scripture? What could you use to assist you in your study of scripture? I mean, now we have phones, and so there's Google, but I mean, what, what would you recommend to assist? So you, you pick a translation, you want to study it. What would you recommend or what would be good to help in the assistance of studying the Bible or only use the Bible and use nothing else? Very good question. Um, and it's a complicated answer because, again, the fundamental belief, the only thing that we know for certainty for, for a certainty that is infallible is the Word of God, okay? Anything other than the Word of God is subject to error, okay? And you can say this about the SDA Bible Commentary because I oftentimes use it as a guide to help me understand the Bible and to explain certain scriptures and to give me more insight with regards to a certain passage. Is it infallible? No. Okay, there, there, you can go through the Bible commentary and you could probably find some mistakes. This is why they have revisions. This is why, and even in the commentary itself, it says we're basing it on the light that we've been given. So God gives us certain light and as we receive the light and accept the light and walk in the light, more light is given. So yes, I believe that God is not giving up on his end time remnant church. More light will be given to us as this earth's history is starting to proceed, more light will be given unto us and more understanding and more interpretation will be given to us and we'll have a better and deeper understanding of the word of God. Yes. If, if I could just add to that, David, you know, the thing that comes to my mind is a good concordance. Yes. 
a good concordance. A concordance is something that, that lists the words that are in the Bible and help you understand their original uh, meaning. So uh, a good concordance could help you find a word. If you want to look up faith, a concordance would show you all the places in the Bible where it has faith, and it would show you the original uh, meaning of that word in that particular verse. You know, so like you're talking about commentaries and things like that, it's good. Uh, it came to my mind a good concordance would help. Yeah, and, and some would, would argue, okay, that you should only stick to Adventist sources, okay? Now, I have to admit, I've used non-Adventist sources. So in some instances, and I use this analogy, and I think Pastor Doug uses this analogy too, um, using non-Adventist sor sources is like eating watermelon. Okay, you don't want to discard the whole watermelon. You eat the watermelon, but you spit the seeds out. Right? So sometimes using non-adventist sources, there may be some stuff that you can identify as error, so you just discard that portion of it. So you need to be careful when you use non-adventist sources for that reason, because sometimes, as the devil does, he intermingles truth and error, and sometimes it, beca it can become so intertwined that it's difficult to distinguish the two. Stefan, you have a question? Yes, I have a question. Is there a possibility that there will be new scriptures discovered that will add to our translations as it were because we've been always been looking at texts that have been discovered or saved is it a possibility we'll get newer or you know a fresh trove of scriptures as it were very good question now the bible says okay man should not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god so what word proceeds out of the mouth of god we do know that in the end time, and with regards to prophecies, okay, the Bible says that surely the Lord will do nothing unless he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Okay, so if something big is coming, you best believe that the Lord is going to raise up a prophet to speak to his people, okay, to guide them in the last days. We as a Seventh-day Adventist church believe that the spirit of prophecy is still with this church. He spoke through Ellen White, and we already talked about where we should put the spirit of prophecy in relation to the Bible. The Bible is the infallible word of God, okay? The spirit of prophecy is a lesser light pointing to the greater light. Just like the lesser light has, just like the moon gives no light of her own, but only reflects the light of the sun, so the spirit of prophecy so reflects the light. So just to finish on that topic also, um, with regards to revelation, it also, with regards to God's revelation to us, he said in the last days, your sons, will, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, okay? So I believe that there will be more prophets in the end time. God has not left us abandoned to swim out on our own. I think that, but we, we need to accept the light and the light that we've given. How much of the spirit of prophecy do we know? How much are we, are we walking in the light that has been given to us as Adventists? Then more light will come. Yes, Pastor. Okay, so I have two things here. Um, so one is a statement uh, It says we should pray before we read as Elder Santiago said and the Holy Spirit will lead us. So that's a good, good statement. Um, and then we have a, a question here is, is it true that some of the more modern Bible translations skip some verses that are found in older translations such as the King James Version and the New King James Version? It is and, true. And one of my least favorite versions is the NIV. For that reason, there are certain portions of scripture. There's, I, I can't, I, I tried searching for it. I do remember have, doing a study on the NIV um, with regards to the NIV version, but it doesn't mean I, I take the NIV version and I discard it completely. There are some translations of the NIV, there are certain verses that I will actually use because it conveys the message more clearly. I'll give you a, a very quick example Philippians um, 4.13. The King James Version, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, okay? That is a powerful verse. Translated into the NIV, I can do all things through him who imparts strength. It loses the power, it loses the poetry, you know, that, and this is why I love the King James Version because the poetry, and if you'll notice, as we've gotten farther and farther away from the original King James Version, people are starting to remember scripture less and less. Because the King James Version is one of the best versions with regards to memorization. Mm -hmm. It's easy to remember, but it was written in the Shakespearean language and in that old English language where it was easy to remember. Um, one of the, 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 the things that is more, most difficult today as a pastor or as a preacher or as a teacher is to get up before a congregation and say, open your Bibles with me and let's all read together. <laughs> yeah. 
it almost sounds like Babel, you know, because everybody's reading different versions and it doesn't, it doesn't, there's no continuity. I mean, in this church in our pews, we have the, each Bible is the New King James Version. Some other churches use only the NIV. Some use only the King James Version. So um, with regards to that, yeah, the people that I've known that are, that are real pure King James enthusiasts, those are the ones that they could quote you verse for verse and, and, and they, can, they can recount entire portions of scripture that I just haven't seen in some other versions. Yes. Very good, very good. I, I agree with you. Um, uh, so uh, Joanne has a statement here saying, so you have to be well grounded in the truth to discern what is error. So, yes, definitely. Yeah. You, you, you need the Holy Spirit. This is why the Holy Spirit is there. And um, uh, this is an, another uh, slide with regards to um, the different um, cultural experiences, okay? How can cultural experience affect our um, understanding of the Bible? And we look at the Bible itself and we try to understand different parts of it with regards, and we try to put it in a cultural context. Some examples like are, for instance, when you study the book of Ruth and Boaz, um, Ruth comes, does what Naomi tells her to do and waits for Boaz to have eaten and drunk and to go die, lie down. And when he lies down, she tells him, uncover his feet. And it seems like a strange custom, like what does that mean? He un she uncovered his feet and then laid down next to his feet. And then when he woke up, he was surprised to see her there and he says to her, she says to him basically, put me under your wing or put me under your cloak. And if you read that word for word, you lose the whole cultural experience that, that exists there because when you study the culture at that time, she, Ruth was basically giving a wedding proposal to, to Boaz, telling him to marry her and to take her under his wing. Um, and later on, when Boaz realizes that there's a kingsman that's even closer to Ruth that should really be her husband, um, he goes to tell Ruth that, you know, go to him first, and then there's this exchange where one man gives the other man his shoe. And that's another cultural thing that if you don't understand it, it seems, what is he giving him his shoe for? But that was a method of using, establishing a covenant um, before the people. So cultural experiences um, can also uh, um, uh, affect our understanding of, of, of the word of God. Um, with regards to also Turn with me in your Bibles um, to uh, why is interpretation needed? And this is, this is where I want to park on how uh, interpretation and um, how it, uh, uh, I'll come back to sin in a second. Why is interpretation needed? Okay, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26, and you may know this story, but I, I want you, there's some important points of that, of that um, uh, text that I want you to understand with regards to why do we need interpretation, why do we need um, explanation, okay? And this is one of the most uh, um, prime examples that I can think of in the Bible with regards to interpretation and understanding. Are we there? Acts chapter 8, verse 26. And I like the, the New King James Version because I like the, when, I, when I study with the New King James Version, they have it categorized. And if you have a New King James Version, it says right there, Christ is preached to an Ethiopian. And it gives a little, a little um, kind of a separation. Verse 26, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. Now, right off the bat, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. So we see Philip is there and the angel is telling him, go down the road. There is something that you need to do. There is something that needs to be taken care of. So we see heavenly beings are already cooperating with human, human, humankind because there is someone that needs to hear the gospel message, okay? The angel spoke to Philip and told him to go. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So first we have an angel, then we have the Holy Spirit. 
Then the Spirit said to Philip. So we have an angel talking to Philip. Then we have the Holy Spirit talking to Philip. Okay, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? Now, again, a cultural experience would be that they would oftentimes read from the Bible, from the, from the scrolls. They would read it out loud, and he's reading Isaiah the prophet. Okay? And Philip says, do you understand what you are reading? And I love the answer that the eunuch gives. And he said, how can I unless someone guides me or interprets me or, or explains it to me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And then he reads from the prophet Isaiah about the suffering that the Messiah would go through and how could he have possibly understood this to be Jesus? In verse, he said, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened out his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? So the eunuch, in verse 34, it says, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Because if you took it in its context in the book of Isaiah, okay, you realize and you study the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is one of the gospel prophets, okay? Most of what Isaiah wrote was about the, the coming Messiah. So he was perplexed by this because I thought the Messiah was supposed to be a conquering king. I thought the Messiah was supposed to be an earthly king. Why does it say that his life is going to be taken from him? Why does it say he's gonna be led as a sheep to the slaughter? And he couldn't understand it. But Philip, in verse 35 says, opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as it, and then later on, we find out that the eunuch ends up being baptized because of this experience and this teaching that Philip gave to him. Philip was an evangelist. He was one of the, the, the best evangelists. But we see the point of that is that the, the angel of the Lord was there, the Holy Spirit was there, and they opened both their understanding and guided these men to a greater understanding of the scripture. And it is no different. The same spirit, okay, the same spirit that existed then exists today. When we sit down to study our Bibles and we ask for the Holy Spirit to come in and, and teach us, angels are even there waiting for you to sit down and read and study your Bible. Angels will be sent out quicker to bring understanding to you and to bring knowledge to you and to, to um, maybe even remove those distractions. Maybe stop that phone from ringing that's going to stop you from studying God's word or maybe uh, uh, keep your eyes open so that you don't fall asleep when you start studying God's word. So. That's why it's important to have um, prayer in, in, those, in those instances. So with regards to the different versions, use more than one. I think that you are doing yourself a disservice if you say, I'm only going to use the King James Version, or I'm only going to use the New American Standard, or I'm only going to use the Message Bible, or I'm only going to use the NIV, or you know, they, they run the gamut. So you want to you wanna kind of compare scripture with scripture. Two of the best apps that I always use, and right here now I have two iPads going in front of me because I like to go back and forth. The Blue Letter Bible, okay, you could take any verse. It has like a little blue letter number next to it, like say Philippians 4.13. You click on the 13, and it'll give you 20 translations of that one verse. Just boom, just like that. And that's the beauty of technology, I guess to some way we become too dependent upon it because like I said, you know, I'm not as good as quoting and I can remember scripture but I couldn't tell you the, the verse. Sometimes I'll even get it wrong when I, when I quote scripture but not in terms of the content but in terms of the, the numbers. Numbers with me just don't um, seem to click very well but um, when we study the Bible in, in an in-depth study and with technology that we have, okay, if this technology was not available if you wanted to study it, you had to bring out a big, large scroll and read from the scroll. And um, even in Nehemiah's time, when they went to read the Bible to the people, they had interpreters there that had to uh, read to the people so that they could understand the Bible in their original tongue because they, the, 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 the language had gotten so corrupted over the years and so influenced by outside languages that it was uh, difficult to read and understand the Bible. So in the same context, we need to um, also have that ability. Yes, Pastor. Uh, so we have a, a statement here that kind of want to roll it into a question. It says, the statement is, I like the fact that Philip obeyed the prompting of the Spirit quickly. We need to do the same. How long should we take to decide <laughs> what we've read in the Bible that we should do it? I mean, yeah. should we get a committee together? Should we check it out? How, how, do, we, how do we respond 
to, to the Bible when it's clear that this is what God wants. Yes, and um, today is the acceptable hour, okay? We cannot put over, we do not know what tomorrow will bring, okay? Now that you are at home with your loved ones, cherish this time, cherish the time that you have with them because no one, okay, has tomorrow promised to them, okay? We've lost church members, we've lost friends, we've lost family to this virus, okay? Death is a reality in this world, in this sinful world, okay? We look for something better. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us, okay? We need to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and when that the Holy Spirit prompts you, okay? Now is the time for you to be baptized and accept Jesus into your heart. Do not delay it, do not, do not um, put it off, okay? Uh, you don't need to be what we, deemed perfect and, and, and knowledgeable in every aspect of the Bible in order to be baptized. You see Philip there, he, I mean the eunuch there, he wasted no time. He said, look, there's water. What's preventing me from being baptized? And he went down and Philip baptized. He didn't say, well, no, we need to do a few more Bible studies first. I need to take you from Genesis to Revelation before I let you be baptized. He said, no. He baptized him right then and there. And um, it's interesting the way if you read the story that Philip was just carried away at that last minute without even... Um, uh, staying there, the eunuch basically had to, had to uh, now find his own way because Philip was taken away from him. So um, yeah, it's important to use the Bible and use different versions, do not just stick to one. Um, I love the way the lesson ends on Friday um, when it says, there's a quote from Ellen White um, taken from the book Messages to Young People, page 260, and the second half, um, it says, do not read the word in the light of former opinions, but with a mind free from prejudice, search it carefully and prayerfully. If, as you read, conviction comes and you see that your cherished opinions are not in harmony with the word, here's the best part, do not try to make the word fit these opinions. Make your opinions fit the word. I'm gonna say that again. See that your cherished opinions are not in harmony with the word. Do not try to make the word fit these opinions. Make your opinions fit the word. Do not allow what you have believed or practiced in the past to control your understanding. Open the eyes of your mind to behold wondrous things out of the law. Find out what is written and then plant your feet on the eternal rock. Okay, and that rock is Jesus Christ. Thank you for, the, for, the, for your participation, for the questions. I've enjoyed this study. I hope I gave you some food for thought. Um, use those versions. Download as many as you can. The Blue Letter Bible, Bible Gateway, they're perfect study guides to be able to compare scripture with scripture and to use different translations. Okay, not all translations are created equal, so uh, choose wisely, but um, don't disregard any one version based on the fact that um, it may contain some, some errors because probably all of them if we were to dissect them further enough would have some different error in them with regards to translation because it's not an exact science god bless you continue to study your lessons and um uh, brother stefan will be teaching next week's class